tonight's guest is Taylor. Taylor, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Vic. Well, thanks for coming on. We appreciate your time. Taylor, please give us a brief bio on yourself. Well, I have uh, lived in Colorado my whole life, about 30 years, and I'm a wildland firefighter. I work for multiple agencies, so I travel all over the country during the summer fighting wildfires. And before that, I was a wolf biologist for about five years. So um, pretty much have been in the outdoors most of my uh, career. Well, that's great. I'm jealous. Yeah, you've got some really interesting occupations. Of course, it really is a shame when you consider what happened to you when you're out there fighting fires. But yeah, of course, we're going to get into that in a bit. As we've already established for the last seven years, you've been a woodland firefighter. Before you had the encounters you're going to tell us about tonight, though, had you heard about any other woodland firefighters having encounters with dogmen, Sasquatch, or anything else that you couldn't explain? Uh, yeah, uh, I've actually heard of a lot of uh, wildland firefighters who've had weird encounters out in the woods, both with dogmen and Sasquatch and other things as well, um, UFOs even. But um, I don't know anybody personally, but uh, I've, I've heard of those uh, stories uh, where people have been on fires and just the, the Sasquatch encounters that you hear about. Uh, where it kind of follows them, throws things at them, uh, and just kind of makes them nervous to be in the woods. But uh, like I say, I uh, I don't know anybody personally, but yes, I do know that there have been other stories. I'm sure they were kept hush-hush too, weren't they? Probably. Typically in the wildland fire community, uh, you get heckled a lot just in general, just because it's that, that crew and brotherhood and sisterhood mentality. and so for you to kind of talk about something like a Bigfoot or a Dogman or whatever, you know, you might get a little bit more heckling than normal. So I know a lot of guys probably don't say too much about it. Yeah, I can understand why they wouldn't. Considering how traumatic your encounters were, did you quit your job or are you still working as a woodland firefighter? I'm still working uh, as a wildland firefighter. It didn't really phase me too much to where I thought I needed to quit and get out of the woods. Uh, I enjoy going out there and the adrenaline of uh, working near fire and the camaraderie of uh, having people that you get to know all summer and traveling the country and sleeping and camping, basically getting paid to camp and hike and uh, being places that either people have never been or haven't been in hundreds of years. So it's uh, pretty good. And something that I definitely wouldn't give up just because of encounters. Well, I can understand why you love the job so much. Now, I've got to ask you this. From what I understand, Taylor, you and a guy who was with you when he had one of the encounters you're going to tell us about tonight drew straws to determine which one of you two was going to contact me about the encounter or about the encounters. What I want to <laughs> know is, did you win or did you lose? And that's why you contacted me. <laughs> yeah so the other firefighter who was a rookie uh at the time me and him had two of the uh, encounters together and yeah we uh we did draw straws uh to see who would be contacting you to finally get the story out there and i did lose so it was uh it was me who had to and but i was happy too i'm a huge fan i uh i listen to your show every friday so it wasn't really too much of a an issue so well, I'm sorry you drew the short straw <laughs> and had to contact <laughs> me. <laughs> that's funny. But I'm glad you knew about the show, though. So, yeah, that's a good thing. You have Norse heritage, and you describe yourself as being an Odinist, Taylor. Please expand on that for us. Yeah. Uh, so, I have Viking ancestry um, from Norway. My mother's uh, side of the family. Uh, we can trace our lines all the way back to the Norse. So I, uh, I really embrace that quite a bit. I try and live my life the old ways if I can. My belief uh, is in the Odinism. Uh, so basically that Odin is the all-father. Uh, and then you have the other Norse gods kind of accompanied with him, Thor, Freya, Loki, um, all that. And so I kind of just follow those old ways and beliefs. And it, it, it's helped me. Um, I mean, I was baptized when I was a baby uh, as Christian. But 
when I was kind of in high school, I just decided that that wasn't really for me. And I kind of just found more comfort, more support um, in the Odinist ways. Uh, and it just it's kind of made my life pretty, pretty happy. And I'm, I'm in a good place with 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 my beliefs. So but, um, but yeah, no, it's uh, I'm everything Viking. So I just I love it. Well, it goes without saying, I'm glad to hear that you're in a good place because of that. But I have to ask you, don't you catch a lot of flack from your Christian friends? Uh, I do. Um, I will admit that they do always kind of say that um, the typical thing like, oh, aren't you worried for your soul? Aren't you worried for what's going to happen? Uh, and I mean, I, I, I try and explain it to them that, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, we all have our own ways. Um, everybody has their own beliefs. I don't believe one religion is right. I mean, there's so many of them out there anymore. So, but no, I mean, they, they, they talk to me about it, but they never, like pressure me, um, but they'll, they'll talk to me and, but they know that I'm happy. I've had a lot of trouble lately this summer while being out on the fire line. And it, like I say, with, uh, with my Odinist beliefs, they kind of helped me push through. And then that's kind of also why I think this encounter happened, which uh, I think it was just kind of meant to happen in a, in, a, in a way that a sign that things were going to be okay. Yeah, I figured they probably did give you a hard time. Yeah, that's too bad. Now that we're talking about this, you keep a keepsake with you pretty much everywhere you go. What more can you tell us about that? So, yeah, um, with my uh, Norse heritage and my Odinist beliefs, uh, I do, whenever I go out on fires, uh, or even just camping in general, uh, I always take a little carved Odin wooden figurine with me, and uh, it stays with me in my sleeping bag uh, next to me at night. Uh, and the reason why I have that is uh, for guidance, for wisdom, and uh, I guess you'd say protection um, while I sleep. Uh, and it's just I've done that since about high school. Uh, and uh, it just, like I said, I, I take with me everywhere I go when I go camping or whenever I get called to go to a fire and uh, we go for our two week assignment. I, uh, I'll, I'll pack it in my bag and yeah, uh, it's, it's with my, in my sleeping bag every night. Huh. That's interesting. Your encounters happened around Fall Lake in Minnesota, Taylor. What can you tell us about that area? So I'm not too familiar with Minnesota's area. Like I say, I was just out there for a two week fire assignment, but from being out there and kind of seeing the area, it's, it's typical Northern Minnesota. You got the, the timber. Um, it's pretty thick up there around fall Lake. It's, uh, it's, uh, got kind of like the wet marshlands as well. And then you got a lot of brush willows, things like that. That'll be in the lowlands. But I mean, just that typical what you picture Northern Minnesota to be the, the heavily forested, lots of lakes, the land of lakes kind of area. So, uh, and it, it was August. Uh, and so it was still pretty warm. So it, it was uh, nice temperatures, not cold or anything. Yeah. I've been up there before. That's a pretty area. All right, Taylor, you've got a lot to tell us about tonight. So let's get to it. Please tell us about your encounters. Now give us every last detail that comes to mind. Yeah, so uh, we were called out for a fire uh, in August, this past August, actually, and uh, up to Minnesota. So the crew and I went out and traveled from Colorado up to uh, around the Fall Lake area up there northeast of Ely, Minnesota. And uh, for those who don't know, a typical fire assignment for wildland firefighters is about two weeks uh, and so we got up there, I think it was around August 5th, somewhere around there. And then we would have left around uh, the 20th, somewhere around there. Uh, and you're usually working 14 days straight. There's no days off in between or anything like that. Just 14 days straight uh, and anywhere from 14 to 16 hours a day. Uh, and so we got up there in our first day, uh, we were up there to go fight one of the fires that they were having up in that area, but they also had called us up there to go do uh, burn operations and kind of get some of the fuel and uh, kind of do some reduction projects up there uh, by doing saw work and burn work and things like that. And so 
we were up there uh, and it was about the second or third day uh, that we were up there. And I had my rookie firefighter with me. Uh, it was his first year in fire. I mean, completely new. Uh, and we had divided the crew into squads, uh, initial attack squads, IA uh, is what uh, the typical abbreviation is. And what that is, is when you go somewhere and there's new starts, new fires, um, initial attack is exactly what it sounds like. You're the initial people to go and attack this fire. And so we had about a 20 person crew and divided it up into squads. Uh, I was a squad leader. So I had about six people, if you include myself uh, with me. And so we divide up in the squads to go kind of do some of these burn operations. And this new firefighter and myself were walking down this old two track road that we were using as a line uh, to burn off of. And we had gone about two miles or so from the truck uh, and we were burning as we went. And then we would kind of stop and then burn again and uh, just kind of doing a pattern, a uh, burn pattern. And when we got to this one area where there was a few willows, uh, I told my firefighter, hey, let's go light those willows off because I've, I've uh, had willows uh, on other fires before and they're pretty uh, receptive to fire and uh, they're usually pretty good conductors and will get everything going. And we were having trouble getting a lot of the grass going and the smaller brush. So I figured lighting that willow off would be a good idea. And so I told him, I was like, hey, go over there, uh, light that willow off. He's like, okay. So he started walking over there. And when he got pretty much right up to it and was about to start like bending over to kind of put the drip torch, which is what we use to do burn operations, um, when he was about to kind of start dripping, he kind of stopped and I noticed him stop. And he kind of like had that freeze moment and he was kind of looking around the willow. And I was wondering what he was doing. And so I kind of started walking towards him and I was looking to kind of see what he was looking at. And we both saw it because he told me afterwards, he's like, we both saw this. There was a big black furry creature behind the willow, um, kind of squatted down drinking from one of the little creeks that was right there. And the first thought on our mind was, oh, it's a bear. Let's, let's back off. Um, but he, uh, he kind of scuffed his, like, ma made a shuffle with his boots, which must have alerted this thing. And so it stood up and kind of was startled. But it just kind of quickly stu stood up and casually just walked away into the woods. Now, when it did this, uh, it kind of came out from behind the willow and into the woods. So my firefighter was coming back to me, but I was able to watch this thing as it walked away. And the way I can describe it, and I didn't get much of a look at it because it was, it was so, so, so quick. But the way that I was able to describe it is it looked like a wolf. Um, and having worked with wolves for five years before becoming a firefighter, I... I figured, oh, okay, it's probably a timber wolf. Um, but I, it was pretty big timber wolf, um, from what I, if it was. Uh, and so, and it, and it walked away on all fours, uh, when it walked away. Um, the only thing that kind of was surprising was when it was crouched down and stood up and then went to all fours. But we, uh, we came, we can't, my firefighter came back to me and he was a little kind of shooken up. He's like, oh, there's a bear right there. We got, we got to watch out. And I was like, yeah, I mean, it looked more like a wolf to me. Um, and he knew that I had studied wolves. Most people on the crew knew that I studied wolves because that's like all I talked about. And so I told and he'd never seen a wolf before. So he's like, oh, really? It was a timber wolf. And I was like, it looked like it. And he's like, oh, that's cool. Well, maybe we'll see it again. And But we decided to back out of there because if it was a wolf or a bear or whatever, it was like, well, we don't want to be on its territory. Um, we don't want to burn right here. We can come back and burn this area later. So we walked out of there uh, and that that was pretty much that was pretty much all that happened on that first encounter. Um so then the second encounter uh was a few days later and uh that same firefighter and myself were in a canoe uh up on, on Newton Lake uh which is just kind of north of Fall Lake and we were doing a burn operation up there 
Uh, most of the other crew had already gone through and done the burn. And we were on the canoe paddling in the lake, uh, kind of watching the burn show on one side. And on the other side of the lake, uh, half of the area was still green and the other area had been burned. And so we were watching the green section, uh, trying to make sure there wasn't any amber fallout, anything catching in the green. Because uh, when you're doing burn operations, you have two, uh, two kind of jobs. There's the uh, firing, firing, which is people actually doing the burns. And then you have the holding, which is the people who usually are standing or walking around looking at the green to make sure nothing's catching on fire. So this firefighter and myself were on the lake in a canoe, kind of checking that. And we got to where the green met the already burned area. And we were paddling along. I was paddling. He was sitting in the front, kind of keeping an eye out. And we heard this kind of this pronounced growl or grunt sound uh, because we were pretty close to the shore. um, And we were like, oh, what is that? And uh, we kind of figured it to be a bear or a, an elk. It kind of sounded like an elk grunt almost uh, in a way. And so we uh, kind of kept paddling. And then my firefighter said, Taylor, do you see that? And I was like, what is it? And I kind of started looking over there in the burned area. And it was hard to spot at first because it blended in uh with the black trees and the uh the gray ground from being burned so it's kind of hard to spot at first but from from coming out from the burned area along the edge of the shoreline was this wolf uh and it was black and it was big and it just it just came from the burned area kind of and then made a right and kind of walked along the shoreline um up on a ridge because the the, the shoreline on that side was kind of up a little bit higher and it just walked there and it kind of was watching us and it was kind of keeping pace with us canoeing. And so we just kind of kept paddling and I was like, Oh, that's kind of cool. It's a, it's, it's a timber wolf. And my firefighter was like, Oh wow, cool. And so then we kind of just kept doing our job. We were, we were impressed by it, but again, it was, it was a big timber wolf. It was big, like bigger than most wolves I've seen and read about. But again, I just figured, oh, it's a, it's, I know they do have big wolves here in Minnesota. So I was like, okay, cool. Well, we're going along. It's been five minutes later. And my firefighter said, Taylor, did you see that? And I said, no, because I was busy looking at the burn show that was going on on the other side of the lake. And so I kind of looked over to where he had been talking about. And I was like, no, what, what, what was it? He's like, that thing just stood up and grabbed a tree. And I was like, what do you mean it grabbed a tree? And what do you mean it stood up? And he's like, well, it was walking on the shore and it got to a point where like it was about to fall off of the little ridge and it lifted itself up and grabbed a tree to kind of catch itself and then swung around the tree and kind of got on the other side. And I was like, no way. What do you, what do you mean? It, there's no, it didn't. It's just walking along. He's like, I'm telling you, I, it, it got up. I was like, okay, well, I mean, let's keep going. We got to keep watching for, for embers. So I started watching the, the creature as well, um, kind of keeping my eyes over there to also look for, for embers and any, any fires that were over there. Um, but I was keeping my eye on that creature to see if maybe it would do it again. And so when... We got a little bit further down. Uh, There was another spot where uh, this thing had to either fall off the little bit of ridge that was the shoreline or stand up. Um, And I kind of watched. And sure enough, it stood up on two legs and reached up and grabbed the tree and kind of like swung itself around the tree kind of like a person does whenever a person's like on an edge and they're trying to like kind of keep themselves from falling. And it kind of, after it swung around, it stayed on two feet and then slowly went back to four feet. And I was caught by surprise. I knew my firefighter wasn't lying to me and I was like, wow. Okay. And he said, see, I told you, I, I, I told you it had done that. And 
I was like, yeah, I, I believe you now. Uh, and at that point, it stopped, looked at us, and then went in and turned into kind of the burned area, which was also kind of going up to a green area again. Well, at that time, uh, we also saw a, uh, a, a fire going further in. And I was like, okay, we got to go check this out, make sure there's not a new start. Uh, one of the embers from the burn didn't get over here. But we'll also be careful because this thing might still be over there. And again, this thing was big. Um, like I say, when I was walking off four, when it stood up, it definitely had the, I mean, that the image that immediately went into my mind was a werewolf because the way it stood up and looked when it was walking and swinging around the tree, I mean, it looked just like a werewolf to me. Um, but besides that, I mean, it had the typical dog legs um, cut reversed, um, the, the knees going backwards. Uh, it had everything else on it was black fur, uh, long black fur. And its head was enormous, but it was just looked like a, I mean, a wolf head. I mean, it had the, the, the snout and had pointy ears and its tail was pretty long and bushy. And, but, um, but like I say, it went off and we saw that fire. And so I said, we had to go get this. We got to go check it. So we pulled the canoe up. And again, I told my firefighter, Hey, let's, let's be careful. Cause if this is a wolf. I mean, it might be protecting its territory. Maybe that's why it was following us. So just kind of watch yourself. We'll watch our backs. So we wa we're walking through this burned area, heading in inland. And I started noticing uh, carvings on some of the trees. And I, I, I didn't take notice of it at first. Um, I just thought it was typical people out in the woods carving their names, initials, and the trees and things like that. I've seen it all the time. But as we got further in, we probably walked about, I don't know, a quarter mile, half mile in from the canoe. Uh, and we came up to this one area. And it was about a little 10 by 10, maybe 20 by 20 green patch of grass with a few trees that had not been burned. None of it had been burned. And the trees were only like, I don't know maybe six seven feet tall uh and like i say this whole area was not burnt but yet the fire had crept up around it and then there were some rocks uh in this area as well um kind of kind of i mean there's like small small rocks just like right out of the ground and then there were some that were standing up and i started noticing more carvings on the rocks and the trees and so i took a closer look and i noticed that they were they were runes and again, with my, my Norse Viking heritage and research that I've done and everything, I, I, I knew what it was. I was like, oh, wow, these are runes. And then I kind of looked at the rocks and everything, and I noticed there was a little altar. And so I, I kind of put one and one together, and I was like, oh, it's a little, it's a little, uh, little, little Norse altar or a little um, uh, sacrificial altar if you want to call it that or something along those lines i was like okay i've seen these before and there was a burned out candle uh and then there was two little figures uh sitting on one of the rocks there was a little odin figure and a little thor figure next to the burned candle candle and they were on one of these rocks with a uh, quite a few runes carved into it and so we were like say my firefighter and i were just kind of checking this place out uh, the thing that amazed us was the fact that, again, it had not burnt. I mean, it was literally just a perf almost a perfect circle uh, that had not burnt. But yet, all around it, there were blackened trees. The ground was gray. It was just a nuked-out wasteland that had been burnt. Uh, but we were, we were just kind of looking around, checking this place out. And I was kind of running my hands across the runes, things like that. Well, so then we started hearing a sound. And my firefighter kind of looked up and was looking around. I kind of heard it, but kept kind of looking at the altar and things around it. And so then I picked up one of the Odin figurines. And that's when my firefighter said, Taylor, did you hear that? And I said, no, what was it? And he said, well, I just heard a, a growl. And I was like, okay, well, maybe, maybe there's a bear out there. Maybe it's that wolf again. Let's just kind of watch ourselves. 
And so I was looking at this little Odin figure. I picked up the Thor figure as well. And at that time, my firefighter said, Taylor, do you see that? And I said, no. And I was like, what was it? And he's like, well, look over there at that burned tree. And of course, in my mind, I'm like, well, dude, it's, it's all burned trees. <laughs> I mean, you got to be more specific than that. So he kind of directed me where he was looking. And so I finally saw it. And on a, on a pretty, pretty thick tree, um, a little ways out, I don't know, maybe 20 feet out, there was this clawed hand reaching around the tree about six feet up. And below it, just about a foot, was like part of a head looking out at us, like leaning out. And so the, the, the only things that we could see were this clawed hand, which it was pretty big, pretty big hand. And, um, but the, 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 the hand was big, but the arm was pretty slender, pretty like skinny. And the head was big, but all we saw was about half of it. We saw part of the, the snout and then we saw the pointed ears on top of the head and it was black in color. And we could see one of the eyes um, and I couldn't really see the color of the eye because it was kind of far away, like I say, about 20 feet or so. And, but behind the tree, it made it kind of tough to tell what color the eyes were. But this thing was looking at us. And my firefighter was like, what the heck is it? I mean, it, it looks like a bear. I mean, it's standing on, it's got to be standing up and it's looking. And I was like, well, I mean, it is, it, it is standing up obviously, but. I mean, I don't know why a bear would just be standing up, kind of peeking around the corner like that. But again, having worked with wolves, looking at this thing, the physicality of it, it looked wolf to me. And I was like, well, it's standing on, standing up. It's got a clawed hand. In my mind, I'm thinking, well, again, I mean, it looks wolf, but I mean, I've, I, I, like I say, I've listened to your show. I've done research on werewolves and dogmen and, um, the Norse and the Vikings always had legends and tales of werewolves and things. And so I, kind of on the other side of my mind, besides thinking wolf, I'm thinking, is this a dog man? Is this a werewolf? Am I just seeing things? I mean, we'd been tired. I mean, we'd, we'd woken up at five o'clock every day. This was around four or five o'clock in the afternoon that this was happening. And I mean, we'd been burning all day. We'd been walking all day, checking the burn and I mean, firefighting makes you tired. So, I mean, we just kind of were wondering if we were tired seeing things. So we kind of sat there for about five minutes watching this thing. I finally had put in the Odin Thor statues down. And I told my firefighter, I was like, hey, we got to get going. I mean, we, we can't sit here all day watching this thing. Um, one, because who knows what's going to happen. Two, we got work to do. So I said, let's go check out this, this spot fire that we saw and we'll just keep our eyes open, make sure this thing doesn't follow us, make sure we're, we're safe. Like I say, and so we left the, uh, we left the altar to go walk and check out the spot fire. And my firefighter had already kind of gone ahead, but I kind of stopped and turned around and I don't know what made me do this. Um, Again, maybe I was tired. Maybe it was the part of me that was kind of thinking since I've been seeing this little Norse statues and runes and everything. Maybe it was that. I don't know. But I turned around and I kind of said loud enough for, for like, for whatever was standing there, or whoever would have been standing there. I, I said, Fenrir, you are Loki's son. You are bringer of Ragnarok. This is your domain. We mean you no harm. We are here to protect the forest. And I turned around and walked away. And I could say, I don't know why I would have said all that, but I did. And I caught up to my firefighter and we went and checked that spot fire and put it out. And that was the, uh, that was the second encounter. So it was the second week. Um, because again, a typical fire assignment is about two weeks long. And so in the second week um, is when the other encounters happened. And so we had, it was my squad again, and we were camped out 
for the night. And most of the guys were sleeping up around the truck uh, because there was only the six of us, like I say, and we had a squad truck. And most of them were sleeping up around there, maybe a couple feet from the truck. Some of them had tents. Some of them didn't. For me, whenever I'm out on fires, I like to go pretty far away from everybody. Uh, One, because I wake up earlier since I'm the squad boss. Um, Two, I don't have to hear anybody else snore or any other noises. And three, I like to just, when I'm out in the woods, I mean, it's, it's peaceful. It's a pretty unique environment. And I like to just look at the stars and I mean, I'm camping. It's, it's supposed to be enjoyable and relaxing. So I like to be pretty far away from everybody. Uh, so I was about 200 yards or so from, from everybody else. And my sleeping setup, uh, most guys, like I say, use a tent. Uh, some guys don't, but most of that people do. My sleeping setup when I'm on fires is I put a space blanket on the ground and then I have a little foam mat that I put down and then a blow up mat on top of that. And then I have my bivy sack that keeps me dry and I put my sleeping bag inside the bivy sack. Um, and the bivy sack is pretty much like uh, military grade. It's what a lot of the, the military always uses and things like that. But that's how I sleep. So uh, I had set up my bed and everybody else was kind of in bed and all that few hours after going to sleep, um, I started hearing some sounds out in the woods, but having been in the woods plenty of times, firefighting, camping, everything like that, I didn't make much of it. I was like, oh, I always hear sounds when I'm this far out from everybody. Uh, And so I kind of went back to sleep. It was about another hour later, I started hearing sounds like could hear something walking uh, kind of crunching the sticks and, and, uh, just making kind of like, kind of like gruffing sounds. Um, I, I would say, and I was like, Oh, okay. I mean, something's definitely there as I was laying there. I'm thinking that. And, but again, I was like, eh, I've, I've had, I've had moose come up to my, right up to me as I slept and I would see them finally. Like I would have felt them and, I wouldn't even move. I just kind of lift my head a little and look at them and just lay there and the moose would go away. So, I mean, I, I, I've had animals come right up to me as I've slept. So I didn't really take, take much into it. So I went back to sleep. Well, it was a little bit later, about 10 minutes after that. And I started feeling this warm, like, like warm sensation across my face, like a, like a wind or I mean, it felt more like a breath in all honesty, but I kind of, and so I kind of, and, and it moved like it, it with the force of it, it kind of like blew my hair. I have long hair. So it kind of blew my hair into my, into my forehead. And I'll, so I took my hand and I swiped it back, but with the warm, with the warmness, I just thought it to be from the, fi- from the fire, from the winds that were around the fire area here. Because when you're in a forest fire, I mean, the heat kind of is is in the air and kind of creates that uh, that kind of that vortex area. And we were close to the fire. And so I just assumed it was that, the heat from that. So, again, I had swiped my hair back uh, and just kind of was still laying there asleep. And it was like a minute or two after that, I felt it again. And so I was like, oh, what could this be? So I kind of covered myself up uh, with my with my bivy sack. Well, so then it was like ten minutes later. Uh, I'd I had again I was asleep but awake I guess uh, in a sense, and I felt this like poke or tug down by my feet, down by my lower leg. Uh, and I was like, oh, "What the heck? What is that?" Didn't didn't really pay attention to it. I thought maybe I just fell off my little mat. Well, then I felt it again. And so I kind of like, well, maybe it's, again, maybe it's a deer, maybe it's a moose. I've, I've had animals come up and bump me before. And I was like, eh, it's probably something like that. So I, so I didn't really worry about it. But then again, it was a third time I felt it. And this time was a little bit more like a little bit over like a, a jerk tug. And so I was like, what the heck? So I sat up thinking I would either startle or scare whatever it was. And I didn't startle it, that's for sure. Um, but there is this I I I there's this black creature um just sitting there. 
uh, kind of crouched down, down by my feet. And I was like, at first I thought it was a bear because its back was turned towards me. And so the way it was kind of crouched down, it looked like a bear. And I was like, oh God, it's a bear in my mind. I'm thinking this. And I've heard stories of people who've had bears next to them and, and, and like kind of drag them with their sleeping bag and things like that. And I was like, oh, okay. Uh, so I kind of wiped my eyes to kind of wake up and kind of see what I'm seeing better. And I think by then it must have noticed me. Um, the movement of my hand coming out of the sleeping bag and all that. And so it kind of turned its body, again, crouched, but turned its body and was looking at me. Now, again, with the fire being close, the forest fire, just like with the warm, the warmness of the air and all that, the other thing that when you're near a forest fire and if you got low hanging clouds is it creates that inversion layer and kind of keeps the light of the fire kind of in the area. So it kind of provides a natural light at night. So this thing was lit up, um, not completely, but enough to where I could get an outline and see some features. And it, as it looked at me, it, again, it had this wolf head and it had long arms and a clawed hand as best I can describe it. And I, I know, again, researching and listening to other um, eyewitnesses on your show, how they describe a dog man, how they're kind of big and muscular looking. And this wasn't muscular. This was thin, athletically built, like a sprinter. I mean, it was built like it could run, like it could move. Um, but like I say, it, it, it had turned when I when it saw it must have noticed me. It had, like I say, just the wolf head is the best I can describe. It had that snout. It had um, the pointed ears on top, had fur. It was, I mean, the fur must have been, I, I don't know, a couple inches, four inches long, something like that. And it just stared at me and it had these, these deep yellow eyes. And when I was working with wolves, uh, before firefighting at one of the wolf sanctuaries, we had a wolf who had yellow eyes and you were always just hypnotized by him whenever he would look at you or you'd look at him. And that's what this thing had. It just, it hypnotized you to look at its eyes, but it just, it just was sitting there crouched down looking at me, had one hand on the ground, the other hand kind of like up, um, kind of just like in the air. Um, and so I was kind of like, say, sitting up, looking at this thing for about a minute or two. And I finally decided to reach down. And as I said earlier, I, I, whenever I'm out camping or firefighting, I have my little Odin statue in my sleeping bag. And so I grabbed it and I pulled it up to my chest and I was holding it. And when I did that, this thing, its ears kind of went back and it began to growl and bear its fangs, which its teeth were, I don't know, two, two inches, three inches long, something like that. Um, and it just, it kind of shocked me a little. And I've been around wolves. I've had wolves kind of get, get aggressive and do that kind of that, that growl and the ears back to kind of let you know, Hey, what are you doing? And so I kind of like, it, it kind of startled me and I was like, Oh, okay. And I put my Odin statue back down and it kind of stopped growling. Its ears went back, back up. It's, it, it lowered its gums. Couldn't see its teeth anymore. And it got up and it just casually turned around, walked on two legs and went up this little, little hill. And, I mean, not a big hill, just little, little tiny, little, little hump that was right there. And it put its hand on a tree and it turned around, looked at me one more time and gave kind of like a little, like a little boof. Okay, and, that's, and, a, and a boof is kind of like what wolves do um, when they're kind of saying, oh, um, 
yeah, it's, I'm in charge. You knew, like, I, I showed you who's boss. And so it did that and it walked out into the woods. And so I kind of sat up there. Like I say, I was, I was, I was sitting up and thinking, what the heck did I just see again? I, I have an open mind. I mean, I've, I, 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 again, listening to your show, researching, watching movies, um, again, the Norse side of things with their sagas and tales of werewolves and wolves and everything. I, I have an open mind. So I was like, I'm pretty sure I just saw a, a, a dog man, but to me, it, w- it looked more werewolf. And again, that's just the, the Norse side of me talking because most of the tales and sagas in Norse and Viking lore deal more with werewolves than dogmen. Um, so I always just attribute it to a werewolf. But um, being up in Minnesota and being up there and kind of near Wisconsin and Michigan, I mean, that's kind of where the whole dogmen um, sightings began, especially in Michigan, I know. So um it it could be either but like i say i i I sat there thinking wow i pretty sure i just saw what i've always heard about so i i I finally laid down uh and i stayed awake though for a while but it wasn't long before i'd fallen asleep because i knew i had to get up early the next day because we still were doing a lot of work up there doing more burns more saw work more fires and so i went to bed but it never came back and nothing ever happened that night uh, and so the next morning came and I woke up and began the day. Uh, and so then on my, the last encounter that I had had, uh, it was the second to last day that we were there and it was nighttime again, we were camping and I still was away from everybody. I I, again, I didn't let that encounter phase me. I, I still like being away from everybody. Uh, and so I set up my little site and I fell asleep. Uh, I kind of took me a while to fall asleep because I wondered if maybe this thing was going to come back. So I kind of stayed awake for a little while, but finally I went to bed. And it wasn't long before I started hearing the sounds again. And so I was like, okay, maybe, maybe this thing's back. Um, let's. Let me, let me kind of prepare myself. So I kind of like was in my sleeping bag, just ready for whatever would happen. Uh, but nothing, nothing happened. Just heard the sounds. So I kind of closed my eyes and it was maybe 15, 30 minutes later. I, I have to guess I started feeling the, the tugs again. And I was like, okay, this thing's, this thing's doing it again. I, I let it tug. And so then the second time tugged again, I'm like, okay, I'm about to sit up and confront this thing again, I guess. The third time it wasn't a tug. It wasn't a poke. The third time I was grabbed in my sleeping bag, in my baby sack. And this thing pulled me about 10, 15 feet from my little sleeping spot into this little flat area surrounded by the trees. And it dragged me across the ground and then let me go. And I, that made me like, what the hell? And I, I immediately unzipped all my, all my, uh, zippers and I got right out of my bivy sack and sleeping bag. And I'm not really prepared (laughs) to face whatever this is because I'm not, we like, I don't, I mean, I'm, when I'm sleeping in my in my bags on fires and all that, I mean, we have our Nomex pants and our shirts and all that that keep us safe from the fires and all that. And some people wear those while they sleep. I don't because I don't like, I'm not going to sleep in smoky clothes and all that. So I just sleep in my boxers, basically. <laughs> so I'm standing in this field in my boxers and this thing's standing in front of me. And it's probably 10 feet away. But I noticed again, I had gotten up pretty quick. So I kind of rubbed my eyes. I noticed not only it, but two other creatures standing next to it. And that kind of took me by surprise. I was a little shocked to see that, but I, I just stood there looking at these things kind of in that shock and 
dumbfounded gaze. They all were pretty much similar. They all were black. They all were thin, kind of that runner sprinter kind of build. But the only difference was one of them was far smaller than the other two. And the only thing I can take from it is that it was a juvenile um, and that the other two were maybe the, the parents. But as I'm looking at these things, I mean, just typical, again, that the head was, was huge on, on them and just that typical wolf head. I mean, the snout, the, the, the ears, they were long fur, bushy tails. Um, they had the, the, the dog legs and then long arms with kind of clawed hands. And they, the, the two adults both had the yellow eyes. The juvenile had more of the, like, they were more of like an amber brown kind of eye, um, which I know wolves have had, which wolves have as well. But these things are just, like say, standing there staring at me and they didn't do anything. They just continued to stare at me. So I finally was like, I guess I'll make the first move. And so I kind of reached down and grabbed my little Odin statue because I knew how the one creature had reacted. And as I reached for it and started lifting it up, they started growling, baring their teeth. All three of them did. And I... I, I just kind of held it up and I held it out in my hand and held my hand out towards them. And again, they were, they were, they were growling, baring their teeth, ears back. And, but they didn't do anything. Like say, they didn't like come at me. They didn't do anything. The, the one that had, the one that had dragged me and, and, and had been there the night, the other night when it was poking me and all that, it kind of took a step back, but like not really. So I took the Odin figurine and I threw it on the ground towards them. And they, they, they kind of stopped growling and they kind of leaned over, were sniffing it, checking it out. And then the one that had been around most of the time reached down, picked it up, held it up in its hand, paw, whatever. And it uh they they all kind of were sniffing it looking at it it closed its hand and all three of them looked at me and turned around and made their way walking on two legs towards the tree line uh the uh one that had the odin figurine in its hand was the first to go into the tree line and then the other adult and the juvenile was the last one. And it, as it kind of made its way in the tree line, it had got, it had gotten onto all fours and turned around, looked at me and then just walked into the tree line. So I kind of, again, I was standing in this field. I kind of stood there for a second and I didn't know what had happened. I thought I was dreaming and, but I, I, I knew I was awake. But I, I don't know. I thought it was a dream. But so I grabbed my my sleeping bag, carried it back over to my my spot, and then kind of got in and I kind of sat up against the tree that was right there next to my spot, and I kind of kept an eye out the direction that they had left, thinking maybe they'll come back or something like that. But nothing ever did, and so I finally laid down and. I was like, I guess I'll go to sleep because, again, last day tomorrow, um, more work, went to bed. And before long, yeah, I mean, it was the morning. And uh, that was the end of that encounter. But um, what happened on our last day, we had a little bit of free time towards the end of the day because we'd gotten all our work done. So I, I walked back to that altar spot that we had found uh, our first week. And so I walked back there just to see what had happened and just to kind of check it out and get a little bit of peace of mind. And when I got there, um, again, everything was still 
kind of in place. It was, I was still amazed that it hadn't burned like, like the area around it. But then I remembered that I was in California on a fire and we were near someone's house and in the backyard, a little bit away from the house, there uh, had been an altar with a, uh, a Jesus statue. And the same thing had happened. Um, this, the fire that was there had come up to that little altar and just burned around it. It did not even touch the little, like literally the one, two foot by two foot area that the little altar was at. And so it kind of amazed me and it brought me back to that. And I was like, man, maybe there is something about, about religions and I don't know, maybe there's some higher powers out there. And I don't know, but uh, what I noticed that caught my eye was there was the burned candle on the altar. There was the original Odin figurine, the Thor figurine, and sitting next to those was my Odin figurine. And it caught me by surprise. And I didn't know what to think. Um, I, I didn't take my figurine. I left it. Uh, I was like, okay, well, I mean, this is obviously a sign of some sort. But uh, I kind of hung out there for about 15 minutes. And I, I sat on the ground. And I just kind of sat there. I didn't, I didn't say anything, do anything. And finally, I kind of said a little, a little prayer to Odin and Thor and, and, uh, got up finally. And as I walked out, I, again, I turned around and I said, Fenrir, this is, this is your domain. You are son of Loki. I, I do not want to harm you. I do not want any harm. And I, I walked away. And, uh, the, the next day, uh, we, we, we traveled back to Colorado and we were back home. Uh, so, but, um, but those are, those are my encounters. I mean, that's what happened while, while we were out there uh, this past August. I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you this, Taylor. The odds of an Odinist stumbling upon an altar in the woods with Odin and Thor figurines on it are probably less than hitting the mega lottery. For anyone wondering if you're telling us the truth about that, what would you say to them? Uh, I mean, yeah, I, I agree. It's definitely uh, one in a million for sure. But um, I mean, there's a lot of things in the woods. Um, I It's not the first time I've stumbled upon one of those altars and not one of the first times i've actually stumbled upon a altar um i've been on uh, a few fires and then just even on camping trips walking in the woods uh, i've found other uh altars whether they're norse like that one or even i found a buddhist altar i found a, a, a one with a little jesus statue so i mean they're out there um People will put things out there. I know in, I know in Southeast Asia for sure. I mean, I've heard of. I mean, you, people will put Buddhist little altars in the middle of the jungle, um, just random random spots. And I know that that's the same here. I mean, I know people do that. Uh, so it's. I, 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 I mean, people can say that they've never seen one, but I mean, I've. I've actually seen quite a few um, and it's not always the Norse ones. Like I say, I've seen a Buddhist one. I've seen one with a Jesus statue. After you had that first encounter, how sure were you or weren't you that it really was a wolf that you saw? Uh, after the first encounter, uh, I, I wasn't really sure at all. Um, Cause again, with, when it had kind of moved out from the willow uh, bush, it was walking on all fours and kind of went into the woods. And like I say, I thought at first it was just that a, a large timber wolf. Um, I mean, I know in Minnesota, they do have pretty big wolves. Um, the only thing that had kind of made me question it was the fact that my firefighter had said that it was crouched down and stood up before going to all fours. And I didn't see that part. He did. But uh, when it left from the willow bush, it, it was on all fours. And so I just thought it to be a wolf. Um, and then again, when on that second encounter, when we were canoeing, 
when we first saw it and f- up until that point when my firefighter saw it reach for the tree to catch itself, it, it, it had been on all fours. And I mean, I, I just thought it was a large wolf. I mean, I, again, and, and then until I saw it stand up and reach for the tree and kind of swing around to catch itself, then I was like, okay, maybe, maybe this isn't just a wolf. Would have been really nice if it was just a wolf. Before we move on with tonight's show, I want to put a special request out there. If you've had an encounter with what you think was actually a werewolf and not a dogman, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. This Halloween, I'd like to hear a special show on that. If I get enough werewolf encounters coming in, then I'll be able to hear that show. If you would have wanted to evacuate the area after having that first encounter, was that an option? I mean, it was. Um... We, when the firefighter and myself had gone back to the rest of our squad, uh, we told them, Hey, just heads up guys. There's an animal down here. Um, I said a wolf, my, my firefighter said, no, it was a bear. And I mean, we just, we kind of, we're just saying, we were just trying to tell the rest of our squad that there was an animal and just watch yourselves when you're out here, um, checking the green, doing your burn operation, whatever, just, just make sure your head's up um that there are animals in the area and i mean if it is a wolf if it is a bear if it's protecting its uh young if it's protecting its territory it might get aggressive um so i mean we we could have evacuated but i there there was no reason to i mean we've we've worked around wildlife while on fires before and i mean you just you just kind of put that alert out there to people that hey heads up and Again, having thought it was a, a wolf at first, I was like, okay, I, 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 it's not going to really do anything, especially with a group of people. So, Yeah, thank goodness it didn't do anything. When you and the other firefighter were in that canoe, could you see if the quote-unquote timber wolf had front paws or hands? When it was walking on all fours, no. Uh, it it looked pretty much like it had paws, um, but I wasn't really looking at the feet. I was looking more at just the 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 whole animal itself. Um, it wasn't until the first time it reached for a tree to kind of grab itself when my firefighter noticed it. And then the second time when I noticed it, that I saw that it had more of like clawed hands. Um, and like I say, they were big hands. Um, but no, like when it was walking, like I say on all fours, no, I was, I was more just watching the animal in whole, not just looking at its, its feet. You just mentioned looking at the whole animal. When it stood up, could you tell if it had shoulders like a canid or like a man? Uh, they were more like a like a canid. Um, I, it definitely had more of the uh, wolf uh, physiology, I would say, um, than human. I see. Well, that must have been quite the sight to see. When you felt that hot air in your face that night, did you smell the scent of what could have been breath? You know, no, I didn't. Um, the only thing that I, that happened, like I say, was I felt the warmth. Um, I never smelled anything. Of course, having been in the fire zone for so long, my, my sense of smell kind of goes away because all you're smelling is smoke and my sinuses usually are pretty bad. Um, when I'm in the smoke and the fires, I, I'll go two weeks without being able to smell anything. Um, so no, I, I I never smelled anything. I just I just felt that warmth across my face, and but uh, it was like I say, it's. I mean, if you've ever had an animal like breathe near you or something like that, I mean, you you can tell just that that warmth that uh, that that feeling, and that's that's what it was after the second time it happened. I kind of was laying there like, wow, that felt more like breath than wind, like wind. So. Yeah, the idea of a dogman breathing in your face, it doesn't get much creepier than that. For the listeners who are wondering how you could possibly go back to sleep after being awakened in your sleeping bag by a dogman, what would you say to them about that? Um, 
I mean, for me, I guess I'd say it was the fact that I'm tired from working 16 hours a day for uh, however many days in a row that would have been at that point. Um, you're usually pretty tired on fire. You, uh, you go to bed and you fall asleep and, um, yeah, you don't really give thoughts about it. Same with, uh, eating the food. Um, yeah, you don't really care what you eat. You just need food cause you're starving. So <laughs> I, uh, I just say that, yeah, I mean, it wasn't really the fact of I was scared or anything. I just, I was so tired. I didn't know what maybe was even happening. Well, I'm going to go on the record and say I couldn't do that. <laughs> yeah, there's no doubt about that. Do you have any opinions on why that one dragged you 10 feet into that clearing the way it did? <sighs> you know, I don't. Um, I mean, I I would have to say maybe just to get me further away from everybody to that way if somebody else had seen something or one of the guys had maybe woken up and come over or something. I, I, I mean, I just, I don't know. I, uh, I don't really have an answer for that, but, uh, I mean, like I said earlier, I, with the firefighting lately and I've been having a lot of tough times and again, with my Odinist beliefs, that's what's kind of pushed me through and helped me get through a lot of hard times and, I, I just, I, I really believe that maybe this encounter was like meant to happen and a way to like show me that, yes, times are tough. You're going to face some scary things, but it's going to get better. And I think maybe that, maybe that's what it was. Like the dogman had dragged me. I was scared. It was freaking me out. But then they just stood there, looked at me. No, no confrontation no attack or anything they took the odin figurine walked away and then i found it the next day and i i, I think just kind of like a, as a show of peace of mind and that things will be fine so I, I i don't know um that that's my take but yeah i don't really have a true answer i guess that's about as vulnerable as a situation as you can be in yeah not good at all Later you say they did, but when those three dogmen were standing there looking at you, were they showing any kind of emotion on their faces when you first saw them? Um, I mean, the young one, I, I guess I would say, did kind of have curiosity um, on its face when I had stood up and jumped out of my, my, uh, my, my sleeping bag. But the other two, n I, not really. I, they just, they kind of just had a calm demeanor about them, almost like they, I mean, basically, like, they knew that I wouldn't be able to do anything if they were to attack. I mean, I mean, I would fight back, but I mean, I'm pretty sure I'm not going to be able to take two dogmen, definitely three. But uh, um, I think they kind of knew they were in charge of the situation, but they also knew that they were controlling the situation in a way that, again, they didn't want to do anything. Um, they just were, I don't know, confronting me or again, something, but, uh, no, I, I, there wasn't really any, like any emotions or anything, except for when I had grabbed my Odin figure and they, they were growling and kind of baring their fangs and did show a little bit like a, a aggression, like in that moment. But no, it, it was just, like I say, a calm demeanor, like, Hey man, what's up? If you have three dogmen standing around you like that, then yeah, they're definitely controlling the situation. How sure are you or aren't you that the encounters you say you had were due to you handling the Odin and Thor figurines? Um, I mean, I don't know, really. I, I, I mean, there's part of me that believes that, again, maybe this was a sign from, from the, the, the Norse gods that, a uh, way to test me uh, in my in my struggles. Uh, like I said, I've been dealing with a lot of things with firefighting, um, hard days, long days. You're just tired. You're just makes makes things tough. Makes you you're missing a lot at home. You're missing your family. You're missing. I mean, just it's it's a tough life, and you struggle through it. And I'm not the only one. There's a lot of guys and gals out there who do. And but uh, I mean, it 
maybe it was just a test is the one of the one of the things i think of and um the other thing i think of is maybe it was just a a, a chance encounter maybe i uh, maybe somehow i just chance to see all this and experience all this and i i just i don't know i i, I take it kind of all ways well that's about all you can do is just take it step by step do you and that other firefighter talk about the two encounters you had together often? Uh, we do, actually. Um, we stay, we're good friends. Uh, and uh, again, with him having been a rookie and I, mean, I got seven years firefighting experience. So he kind of, he kind of, I, I kind of took him under my wing. And so he kind of really appreciated that for me teaching him everything. But no, yeah, we, we become good friends and we stay in contact and uh, he, we, we talk about the encounters quite a bit. Uh, we, we agreed at the time that we wouldn't tell any of the other guys and gals on the crew, because again, you, you, you get heckled already just being part of a crew um, or in the wildland community in general. I mean, you're always kind of giving each other, like, like pushing each other around and just kind of that, that mentality, like, Oh, Hey, I'm going to pick on you. Oh, Hey, I'm going to pick on you, but just in fun. And so we figured like to say something like this would just make it worse. Um, so we decided to keep it to ourselves and, um, we did tell our families, he told his, I told mine and, and then we finally were like, well, you know, we should, we should get the story out there. Uh, and I had told him how I, I, I knew about your show and I've always listened to your show and he's like, okay, well, let's, let's, let's send it to him and that way it can get out there and people can hear it. And, uh, we, like I say, we drew the straws to see who would have to, who would have to talk and tell the story and uh i drew the short straw unfortunately but uh but i was happy to um i'm a huge fan like i say so well thanks for listening well it's about time for us to get out of here taylor but before we do do you have any closing comments you'd like to share yeah um i just basically would say that uh, don't let anything like situations like this or even any other situation that you find scary affect uh affect your daily life um as i said i mean with what happened to me still being able to sleep 200 yards away from people and knowing that something had done this to me and i mean i didn't let it phase me i uh i just continued to do what i love to do and camp out and sleep out and uh just like say live live my day each day and um the other thing i would say is that don't let anybody discourage your beliefs. I mean, I know I mentioned it earlier and you had asked it about, do some of my Christian friends say anything about me being an Odinist? And I mean, they don't really, like I say, completely disown me for it, but I mean, I don't let anybody bug me about it. I mean, I, everybody has their beliefs and like I say, everybody, there's so many people out there that have different beliefs and you just got to stick with it. And uh, yeah, I mean, just be able to push through everything. Full disclosure, Taylor, you're the first Odinist I've ever met. <laughs> well, hopefully I'm not the only one. Hopefully there'll be more. You never know. Thanks again so much for your time and have a great night. Thanks, Vic. You too. Thanks. We'll see ya.